uh, does have 20 minutes uh, for, well, both parties have 20 minutes for that matter, but petitioner uh, may reserve a portion of your time uh, for, uh, for rebuttal if you choose to do so. If you choose to do so, you need to keep track of your own time at the podium clock. Uh, the court will not be doing that for you. Um, out of respect to counsel and to avoid any interruption, I'd ask that uh, people in attendance make sure their phones are off uh, so the proceedings are not uh, interrupted. Uh, we have reviewed um, the filings we have received. We've conferenced the case. We'd encourage you to keep that in mind as you present oral argument to us. Please also um, make sure that when you approach the podium and begin your presentation, uh, that you uh, tell us the name and the party that you represent. Uh, proceedings are being recorded and will be posted for broader consumption uh, in due course. If parties are splitting time, I will defer that to you, but each side has 20, uh, 20 minutes. Uh, with that, Mr. McLaren. May it please the court. <clears throat> my name is Bill Morrison. Uh, uh, Mr. Morrison, I apologize. That's fine, Your Honor. Uh, my co-counsel here, Jeff McLaren, is, is present in Arizona Council. I am Bill Morrison from Haynes and Boone in Dallas, Texas, and it's a pleasure to be in front of you here today. I represent the petitioners, all of whom are challenging the district court's findings that it can exercise specific, specific personal jurisdiction over them based on their alleged involvement and company-wide and nationwide business decisions that trickle down through multiple levels of management to impact a healthcare facility located in Arizona. The district court's decision erodes the due process protections afforded to non-resident defendants like petitioners and warrants this court's review by special action. An appeal of the district court's decision is not an adequate remedy because it would require petitioners to defend this matter in Arizona where the court does not have jurisdiction. In addition, I would uh, mention that there are five other cases pending in Arizona with similar facts against the same defendants, so we expect uh, the decision of this body to have an impact on those cases as well as we proceed. With respect to those cases, where does this case stand sort of chronologically? Is it at the beginning, one of the first cases, or a middle case, or toward the end? I think it's one of the middle cases, but in terms of procedurally, there are others that are um, that were filed first that for a variety of reasons, including the bankruptcy, which was listed um, in, the, in the materials, created a stay, which delayed some of the proceedings. So procedurally, this one, I would say, is kind of in the middle, although we're proceeding down the line with some other cases. And with respect to those other cases, I, I'm gathering, and I get that we're here for one case, not others, but um, that there may have been motions to do, motion practice on this very same ground um, that predates the motion practice here. Is that fair? That, that's correct, Your Honor. And was special action um, relief sought in those cases? Um, not yet. Okay. So in terms of the actual order of a district court, this was the first. Okay. But there were superior court decisions that predated this this um, case on personal jurisdiction or not? Uh, not that predated this case, but predated this hearing, okay. yes. Um, okay. So in the, in the interim between the time we argue those cases and this case was set. Thank you. It, just for a point of clarification, when you filed your, your motion, um, in the motion itself, in the body of the motion, you didn't uh, ask for uh, discovery, did you? We did not, Your Honor. But after the ruling came out, you did? We, we did. Okay. The, the issue of discovery is an interesting one. Because of the, the history with these parties, there's been um, a, a large volume of materials that have been produced, a number of witnesses who have been deposed, uh, including many of the petitioners today. Uh, Mr. Scott, who is a petitioner, has been deposed on multiple occasions. There have been thousands of emails that have been produced in the underlying bankruptcy and, and part of the, uh, we use search terms in the, the bankruptcy case and they were pr produced to, uh, to plaintiff's law firm and those search terms included words like budget and census and a lot of the issues that we're here to discuss today. And so it's, it's our belief that, that with the volume of materials that have been produced and been reviewed by, by plaintiffs, that, uh, that they were 
failed to make a prima facie showing of jurisdiction and additional discovery is not warranted. Well, didn't Judge Mahoney order discovery in another case? Yes, Your Honor. And that discovery is ongoing, I'm assuming? We have to conclude that discovery by the end of February. Okay. And was that related to the same nursing facility or same facility we're talking about here? It's related to a different facility, but again, I expect we're going to be exploring Arizona generally in those depositions. We do have an agreement. In the discovery depositions for the other matter. Is that what you're talking about? That's correct. Yes. Focused, limited to the issue of jurisdiction. At the outset, it's important to note that the law here is not disputed. The parties agree that specific personal jurisdiction can only be exercised if the plaintiffs make a prima facie showing that each petitioner engaged in purposeful and forum-directed activities from which the claims arose. And even if those showings are made, the exercise of jurisdiction must be reasonable. Plaintiff did not and cannot make those showings for two key reasons. First, the plaintiff concedes her central jurisdictional hook, and that is that personal jurisdiction cannot exist over high-level officers merely because of their titles or their involvement in company-wide, nationwide decisions that tangentially impact the forum state. And second, the alleged forum-directed activities are just too attenuated to the claims to create a causal nexus. And I'll address each of those in turn. Well, let's take it, if I could ask you a question on a broader issue. Many of the cases and reading the cases that you've cited in your pleadings refer to the fiduciary shield doctrine. That doesn't apply in Arizona, does it? Well, it doesn't apply in this case because of... That wasn't my question. It doesn't apply in Arizona, does it? I'm not sure if it does or not. Well, hasn't Arizona adopted the broadest possible jurisdictional, only afforded by, only limited by due process? That is correct. And you would agree with me, wouldn't you, that the fiduciary shield doctrine is not part of that due process analysis? It's a prudential analysis that's been adopted by some jurisdiction. I would agree with that. Okay, so if we don't have fiduciary shield doctrine in Arizona, then those cases that you're citing to us don't really have much applicability, do they? Well, they have the applicability in the sense that you're still evaluating the purposeful contacts to the forum state. And our position is that the types of contacts that are alleged in this case are not those types of purposeful contacts that are necessary to form the basis of jurisdiction. The plaintiffs has conclusory allegations that the petitioners were involved in decisions and activities that harmed plaintiffs, and they say that they directly were involved in understaffing and underfunding the facility. But there's no evidence of purposeful forum-directed contacts. Instead, they're just general statements about company-wide, nationwide activities from the petitioners. Throughout these proceedings, plaintiff tries to confuse the issue by equating the general term facility, or the defined term facility with a capital F, which refers to Mesa Christian, with general references and deposition testimony and emails to facilities across the country with a small f. For example, in plaintiff's response on page 25, she cites to three specific emails with various discussions among the petitioners regarding the performance of over 100-plus nursing homes around the country. The emails do not reference a single facility. Instead, one of the emails references in a single sentence performance in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Kentucky, Iowa, Kansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Florida. The Arizona reference is just a simple AZ plus three, talking about what the census was for the month. That's it. But after citing those emails, plaintiff says these facts demonstrate that Tom Scott's level of involvement in the operation of the facility, with a capital F, meaning Mesa Christian, and his contacts with the state of Arizona. We would submit to the court that those emails, and indeed the entire appellate record, 
has no references to the state of Arizona, not a single reference to Mesa Christian, and does not have any of the necessary purposeful contacts with the state of Arizona. Are you disputing that the plaintiffs, the petitioners here, didn't set budgetary funding for the facilities here in Arizona? We are disputing that, Your Honor. Who was setting it then? I'm sorry? Who was setting it then? Who was setting the budgetary restrictions in Arizona? And that's part of the confusion in the case is that you have high level, for instance. I don't care where they are. I asked a question. Who was setting it? It was being set at a local level first. It was then being approved at a regional level. It was being approved at a divisional level. It was looked at by the president of the company, and then it was then approved on an annual aggregate basis by the petitioners. So there was no approval. So they approved it? They approved an aggregate budget, and in that aggregate budget, there were 100 separate rolled up budgets. So there were no approvals by the petitioners of a facility level single budget that would dictate levels of staffing as claimed in the complaint. And your argument is for personal jurisdiction purposes that that level of granularity is required? I would say that more is required than what's here. And I understand that's your point, but with respect to that level, you're claiming that level of granularity is not present? That's correct. And is it your position that it has to be or there could be no personal jurisdiction, or is it something more nuanced? I would say that there can't be under these facts that if the petitioners dropped down to a lower level of management and were managing the homes themselves in the state of Arizona, then sure, we would not be challenging jurisdiction. But here, their activities were not directed towards the state of Arizona. They were directed to company-wide management of their 100-plus homes in a dozen states around the country. And in essence, and it's in the record, these petitioners acted as a board of directors. And so the concept that a board of directors, because of an annual approval of a budget, could be subject to jurisdiction in the state of Arizona because of that activity that's not specific to any particular locale in the state of Arizona, I'm saying is simply not enough under these facts. Let me ask, your focus on a bit ago on facility and facilities, sort of large F facility, small F facility, and I understand you were offering it for a different purpose, but in a way that suggests that there's ambiguity in what the discovery shows. If that's the case, or what the factual record is in front of the court, how should that ambiguity have been considered by the district court? In other words, is it against you as the party seeking out of the case? Is it against plaintiff as the party seeking to hail you into the case? Your clients, I'm sorry. Sure, sure. I think it should be construed against plaintiff. We've challenged jurisdiction. It's incumbent upon plaintiff to make the prima facie showing and to bring forth evidence that would support more than conclusory allegations of jurisdiction. It is clear throughout the appellate record that there are references when appropriate to specific facilities across the country, but none here. No references to Mesa in the hide and seek appellate record that you have. There's just not a single reference to Mesa Christian, and there's a reason for that. It's because these high-level individuals did not get involved in the day-to-day, month-to-month management. They were managing a portfolio of companies, and to the extent that they had concerns about the operations, it was operations as a whole, and that what plaintiffs have done is equate their activities with their own companies, so those companies that sit at the top, with the company that operates the facility at the very bottom. And those are very different things and far removed from each other. On the management side of this, there are over 100 employees, many of which are subject to jurisdiction in this state because they live here, they work here, they manage the facility here, they propose budgets here, 
they approve budgets here none of those individuals are before you none of those individuals or even entities have been sued in this case instead they went to the very top of the organization with individuals who manage a large company and who did not do anything in the state of Arizona your honor I will skip to the second prong of this which is the the nexus that has to be has to be shown and here there's just simply no causal connection from the activities that are alleged and this is in the the compendium of emails where there's a discussion of various things like budget for the company census for the company and again we're talking annual consolidated budgets to the cause of action here there are a couple of emails in the record from which plaintiff argues the cause of action arose and we think it's just simply too attenuated for example the the plaintiffs argue that that petitioner reek mr. reek was the general counsel of preferred care Inc which is an entity that's that's not before you and I will say as a note the district court made a factual error in saying that that preferred care Inc owns the facility at issue here that's just simply not the case and and it's actually in plaintiffs appellate record on page 177 that shows that there is distinct ownership there mr. reek is the general counsel he's a lawyer he's licensed in the state of Texas and he's the general counsel for preferred care Inc the fact that he signed a cost report is of no issue no moment here the cause of action did not and could not have arisen out of that report this is not a breach of contract case or somehow the the cause of actions are alleged to have have arisen you would agree with me that that's not typically what general counsel would do is sign that cost and that sounds more like something that management would do rather than general counsel I don't know that I would agree with that I've been representing health care companies for 20 plus years and and I I would say that that because of the some of the complexities of that that there are there certainly are times where general counsel's will will sign things that that go to the government because of the 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 facing with the government so I don't think it's unusual for representing that it's in compliance with federal law or is that what you're saying by saying that is that what he's doing well just because of the complexity of the document so I just I don't think in in my experience that it's that it's unusual or activity that that's different from from a role that you might expect from from a general counsel mr. Rick is not an operator there's no real allegation or evidence that he is an operator certainly was not involved in management so and I'll reserve the rest of my time very well thank you mr. Lazar my name is Benny Lazar jr. I'm here for the estate of Iona Richardson who is a resident at Mesa Christian nursing home as a vulnerable adult from February 26 2016 until August 12 2017 when she died there I'm privileged and honored and grateful to be here this this morning to be able to do this I'm hopeful and I pray them up to the task it's um in the 20 minutes that that's been allotted to us and I understand the reason for that then before appellate courts with that 20 minutes many times difficult to go over all the proof that we presented I think we presented not just a prima facie case but an overwhelming case for jurisdiction and so I have a lot of material I like to cover I don't think that I'll get to all of it but it's clear that you've read the record and you've looked at the evidence so that gives me some solace but I can slow down a little bit and try to do the best job I can it's it's important I think also to remember that the proof on this jurisdictional issue is inextricably intertwined with the proof on the merits of the case and that sort of a decision that sort of a circumstance I think the courts throughout the country believe the best course of action is to allow the plaintiff 
to put forth his case in an orderly fashion where it's not just 20 minutes to try to discuss emails and, tef and testimony and cost reports so that you get a full view of it and leave it to the trial judge to decide whether there's jurisdiction or a case when that's done. With regards to other cases, um, I think that inadvertently Mr. Morrison misspoke. There was a jurisdictional finding in a case called Hammer that occurred back in 2017, I think. I'm not sure, way back. And no Isn't that case under a motion for reconsideration at this it, time? It, it was under a motion for consideration, but that, along with, I believe, four of the other case, of the five cases that are still in the district court, that, that I think that rehearing was, was uh, denied. Okay. In fact, in, in four of the cases, the trial court found jurisdiction. The other one, the trial court simply ordered discovery, and we're in the process of doing that. As I said, we have, I believe, presented ample evidence, not just a prima facie case, that due to the actual participation of these six petitioners, not just their titles, not just the fact that they were presidents and managers and directors and the bosses of the companies involved, but, but, but by their actions, that they directly affected the day-to-day -day care at Mesa Christian, which resulted in the harm and the death of Ms. Davis. Remember, no hearing was held on the, in the uh, court below, so we need only show make a prima facie showing of jurisdiction here. And I think the law is clear that all uncontroverted allegations in the complaint are deemed to be true. And that factual disputes are to be resolved in favor of the non-moving party, in this case, the estate. So if they make an allegation in, in their affidavit and we present proof to refute it, the law, I believe, requires that that factual dispute be resolved in the favor of the petitioner. Uh, excuse me, in the favor of the estates here. And, and counsel, if I could... Uh, Arizona has not adopted the fiduciary shield doctrine at, at, at this point in time, but isn't there some value in saying that for high-level um, managers, what, who, owners, whatever you want to call them of a nationwide company are not going to be held, held into court for a specific incident um, without showing some type of piercing involved? I mean, isn't there some value to that? I don't believe that it's necessary to show piercing if you can show direct action by that person, by that person, in whatever capacity he's acting. And in this case, is it your theory that they approved a budget, ultimately approved a budget for Mesa Christian yes. that was underfunded? Yes. It, not well, only couldn't it, you say that about any national director or any national board member, that they approve budgets all the time? But that's not... They, they do. And... But that's not the only piece of evidence that we have here. If you have that piece of evidence against the director, it might be enough under the circumstances. But here, we have not only did they approve the budget, but then they took actions to try to keep it enforced, to try to keep the census up, and to try to keep the costs down, the nursing salaries down. And in a nursing home setting, that's how you control profits. Keep the census or the amount of residents up, because that's where the revenue comes from keep the nursing staff down because that's the main expense in the operation of a nursing home. Can I, to follow up on Judge McMurray's question though, isn't it, don't, don't high level managers do sort of two things all the time, approve budgets and then try to enhance revenue and decrease costs? They do, but if they know that the facilities, that they're underfunding facilities and that's resulting in understaffing, then that action should be able to be taken against them, especially when that understaffing results in the death of a resident in a nursing home. And that's what we have here. Remember, we have an allegation in the complaint that they underfunded, they, they knew they were underfunding, resulting in understaffing, Can and that, that caused the death. Can I clarify this point? Is, is the position that they, 
the individuals here made national decisions that resulted across the board in underfunding. So the fact that it was a general decision to underfund across the board is sufficient to give us contacts with the specific nursing home because it was the, it was a universally the case that they knew that all of the nursing homes were underfunded. Or is your position more specific than that? No, I think that, I think it's both. Okay. I think it's both. I mean, I don't think they can get off the hook because they wholesale underfund and say, oh, it was just a national decision that we underfunded all of our homes. If it, if it affects the home that this vulnerable adult is in, then the law should be protecting that interest and saying, you're going to have to come and answer for that here in Arizona, here in this county. So, so you take the position that they also made a sufficiently specific to Arizona decision on this front? Sure, because they make decisions on a home by home basis. They make decisions on a home by home basis. The emails show that. Emails from Mesa Christian or emails from other facilities? In our record, are the emails you're talking about emails that relate to Mesa Christian or are they emails that relate to other facilities in Arizona? Emails in this case, not one of them specifically mentions Mesa Christian, but clearly they're talking about Arizona in the emails. There's one of them I'd like to discuss with you if time permits. But aren't the facilities different? I mean, isn't there, I'm assuming, I don't know this, but I'm assuming a facility in Yuma is going to be able to be run much cheaper than a facility in Phoenix. They are different. That's why it's not just a national decision. In this case, it's not like an insurance policy that you sell that's used all over the country and you have a wreck in Arizona, you can't sue them here in Arizona. In this case, a nursing home setting, a nursing home company, if they're not making specific budgets for each facility, if they're not approving a specific budget for each facility, then that's dangerous too. So when they approve the budget for Mesa Verde, for, excuse me, for Mesa Christian, then they're acting specifically, purposely to underfund and understaff that facility. Just because they roll it up, but the whole process means each one of these facilities all over the country is getting an individual budget that they then work on enforcing to the expense of the residents, like happened here. They never contested our allegation that they underfunded and understaffed, not in the affidavits or anywhere. So that's taken as fact. The key thing to me, and I keep reminding myself in cases like this, there's a difference between seeking dismissal for lack of personal jurisdiction and seeking dismissal for failure to state a claim. And the discovery, as I understand it, and the cases that comes to us is solely personal jurisdiction. Now, I understand that the nature of the claims may affect, particularly if you're talking general and specific jurisdiction, and we only have specific jurisdiction here. But I'm pretty loathe to accept as undisputed issues that go to a 12B6 as opposed to a personal jurisdiction motion. And I think that's what you just described. Well, I thought that the law stated that if there's an allegation that's not contested, that the courts need to accept that as being true for the purposes of a jurisdictional decision. For a well-pleaded fact that deals with jurisdiction, I think that's correct. And I think that that is a fact that deals with jurisdiction because we spend time in our complaint alleging that they operated these facilities in a way that, and this facility specifically, in a way that underfunded it and understaffed it. They could have denied that in their affidavit. As I said before, that's a fact that's inextricably intertwined with later decisions that will be made in the case as to whether or not we're entitled to go forward. But with the proof that we put forward now, and it's important, I think, to understand in answer to an earlier question. As he said, we never got any discovery in this case. The judge ruled on the papers. And so we've put together... Did you request discovery in your response to the motion? Yes, we did. Okay. Yes, we did. And I would request it again here in the event that you feel that we don't have a prima facie case. Because if their defense is, well, there's no emails here involving 
Mr. Christian? Well, because these emails were, were developed in a bankruptcy case where there were diff different issues. But you can see from these emails, in a light most favorable to the plaintiff, to the petitioners, excuse me, I get confused with the parties here because um, we're actually the respondents, but we're the plaintiffs below, as you know. So if you look at these emails in a light most favorable, then it's clear that we've established jurisdiction. I would like, before I get too, too much further in here, to talk about just a couple of these emails that he's, he has discussed generally, because I think that they're illustrative, illustrative of what we're, what we're saying. Uh, one of them is in the appellate record at 254. And it, it deals with uh, Tom Scott, Mr. Scott. And he sends these to all four of the managers and operators of the management company. In reviewing today's census, I'm reminded of the Dallas Cowboys. Every weekend, you think it can't get any worse, and then they prove you wrong. JFC, uh, exclamation points. This is a, a real problem. I expected a downturn over Christmas, not a effing mass exodus. And so he gets a report back from one of the managers, Gary Anderson, it goes to all the rest of them. And it, Anderson says, yes, it's a devastating drop. Go, goes on to say, I asked Mike to look back to see what drop had been in the past. And then he gets a report on Arizona. So he's concerned about all of his companies. He gets an individual report on what's happening in Arizona because all states are different, like all homes are different. This isn't just a nationwide policy. This is dealing with specific problems in specific homes in specific states. And then, and this is what I think is important. I can't keep putting up, Mr. Scott replies back. He says, I can't keep putting up with poor performance. I still don't have a budget I can review or give to the bank, and that's about a foot, and that's about a foot up my ASS. There are more questions than answers on this quit program, and the cover letter on November financials was a piece of fiction worthy of Obama's best speechwriters. And then he goes on and speaks a little bit more, and he says to the managers, the other petitioners, your senior management team is failing all of us miserably. They're on a very short leaf, leash with me. So uh, he has the ability to get rid of them. Scott has the ability to fire them. They're on a short leash. He's the boss. As are you guys. So this is the boss. This isn't just some director. He is running the whole operation. He can fire this whole management, everybody in the management team, not just the people who are running it, but everybody, all the way down the line. He threatens to fire them. So this is hands-on involvement, not some passive director who just goes to director meetings. And then in November of the next year, during this residency, he sends another email, uh, 308 in the appellate record, and he reminds them again, when he's worried, concerned about census, that they're on a short leash. I can still fire you. So this is how the operation is run. The boss has the ability to fire and hire and affect what's going on all the way down the line to the facility. He wants to see the budget because that's what he does. He approves the budget. Robert Reek, he, he did much more than just provide legal services in Arizona. He was one of the two decision makers who, like Mr. Scott, had the ability to make decisions with regards to the operation and management control of this whole company. He provided legal services and advice to various facilities in, in the various states related to operations, he says on his deposition. And he also regularly traveled to Arizona to assist in litigation because that was part of his duties as general manager. So he said on his own deposition that he 
provided services that were related to operation, not just legal cases. He and Scott made the decisions that affected the whole partnership. And there's emails from him in which he's asking for information with regards to budget and census and the same matters that control the underfunding and the understaffing at the facilities. I think it's important to understand that in a nursing home, if you're underfunded and understaffed, that directly relates to the care that can be provided at the facility. And that's where the nexus is. Because we allege in the complaint that the understaffing and the underfunding directly resulted in the harm and the death of Ms. Davis. That's where the nexus is. There's a, a few other emails I'd like to discuss with you with regards to the four managers of the facility. One is especially significant. It's appellate record 309. And it deals with the management contract and their concern with what the management contract is, is admitting. It starts off with an email from Gary Anderson to his three uh, partners. We need to revise our management agreement for future trials. That wording authorizing us to hire and fire all employees. So that's what the management agreement says they do and responsible for quality of care is tough to respond to. And then one of the other managers says, I agree. And one of them says, I told Bob, Robert Reek, we needed to. Guess we need to see if Tom, Tom Scott, is okay with it. And then you can see, well, they're not so sure about when to talk to Tom about it because he's the boss. And because the next one says, hello, Mindy. When and if the door opens, they're talking about when to talk to Tom Scott, when the door opens to do it. He says, there are several other things that could use a fresh look. And then one of the other ones writes back, I will test the waters with Tom Scott. And somebody else says, I haven't talked to him since I had to testify, but will mention to him how difficult that wording becomes when you have a slick plaintiff attorney. And then finally, I think Mr. Tennyson, no, excuse me, Mr. Lundford says, in light of most recent information, I think we need to discuss our position before broaching this subject with Tom. Bob, Mr. Reek, is ready to throw us under the bus. Don't know Tom's opinion. So they're worried about getting fired. And, and counsel, just, I know your time's up, so I have a real quick question. Mr. Tennyson is no longer with us, correct? That's, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in conclusion, like I said, I knew I didn't have time to go through all of this, but we believe we have a compelling case based upon the way this should be looked at in a light most favorable to the plaintiff. If there's any conflicts, you're supposed to resolve them in our behalf to ma make a prima facie case of ju for jurisdiction. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Counsel. <clears throat> Morrison, rebuttal. Just a brief rebuttal. Um, first, I'd like to clarify Tom Scott's role in this. He was just described as the boss. Uh, in fact, he's the client. The, the appellate record shows that um, some time ago, he stepped out of the management. This was back in 2003, 2004. The management of the homes, and he contracted with with management companies to take over that role. So those emails, for context, uh, Tom Scott and his general counsel are the client. Uh, the management company, uh, Mr. Anderson, Lunsford, Provence, and the late Mr. Tennyson were um, providing the services as the board of directors that with a subsidiary of a subsidiary contracted with the home to provide the service. And then in terms of additional context, that, that email from Mr. Scott in the record, I think uh, appellate record 254, the timing is important. It was December 28th, 2015. Mr. Scott is asking for his annual consolidated 
budget consistent with what we described earlier as the client he was relying on the management company to roll up that that consolidated budget so that he can review without a prima facie showing we don't believe that further discovery would be necessary it's just a fishing expedition based on nothing more than conjecture and the uncontroverted affidavits of the petitioners in addition we think a stay is warranted because of the very real prejudice of this case and the other cases going forward if they're if the petitioners are forced to defend these cases without pure personal jurisdiction finally we don't believe that the petitioners could be expected to be hailed into an Arizona court personally because of the high-level decisions they made acting as a board that for a nationwide company making company wide decisions on a roll-up basis this court therefore should accept jurisdiction over this special action and reverse the trial courts order upholding the due process protections afforded to non-resident defendants in Arizona and across the country thank you counsel thank you thank you for your presentation today thank you for your written filings we appreciate them we will take the matter under advisement we'll issue a written decision in in due course court stands in recess